Would you please stand as we read the scripture for this morning? John chapter 19, uh, verses 17 through 30. And Max and Camille are going to be reading for us this morning so you can follow along. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of the, them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. That said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his... I mean, sorry. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his brother there and the disciple whom he left standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here's your son, and to the disciple, here's your mother. From that time on this, disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Thank you. If you could be seated. My favorite part of a book or a movie is the ending. Uh, the last chapter or so in a book and the last five or ten minutes in the movie. I'm guessing it's yours as well. Uh, why? Because we've been hardwired, you know, uh, built in desire to know how things finish, how they end, how it resolves. This morning we have come uh, to that point in the greatest story. It's an epic story. It's a true story for all generations. And it is the story of God and his relationship with humans, us. It is my privilege to be able to look at John 19, 17 through 30. And it has much that we could study and much that we could look at, but I'm a simple preacher. <laughs> and so we are going to focus on just three words that Camille read. It is finished in verse 30. You see, Jesus declares it just before his death before he gives up his spirit. Those three words, which were actually just one word in the spoken language of Jesus and uh, one word in the original Greek, that word actually is to die. And uh, I didn't come up with that. Josue looked it up for me or knew it, I think, by heart, actually. And uh, even had to work with me on the pronunciation of tetelestai. Now, he can say tetelestai, but evidently he can't say Jews. Um, <laughs> well, those words, 
it is finished creates some questions, don't they? At least for me and I hope for you. And that with God's help and his word, as we look into it this morning, we will attempt to answer together. The questions that I would like us to focus on, since he's saying it finished, is when did it start? What was finished and why the cross? Would you bow your heads with me as we ask him to help us in discerning and understanding those questions? Lord Jesus, we ask you, your spirit, to help us through your word and through speaking to us, your spirit to ours, to understand what you would have for each of us this morning. We want to hear from you and not just from a simple preacher. And so, Lord, um, open our hearts, open our minds, and help us in these next few minutes to understand and to grasp what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. In order to help us understand these questions, I would like us to consider two trees, two thieves, and two choices. I might be simple, but at least I can be a little clever. Okay, so two trees, two thieves, and two choices. First of all, we're going to look at answering that question, when did it start? And to help us do that, we're going to look at the first tree. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles if you don't have one and would like a hard copy. I think our ushers, our guest attendants can help you. You can just raise your hand. Uh, we're going to be looking first at Genesis 1 through 31 or 131. And we'll be in Genesis for a few verses. And so as you get there. We read. And this is the sixth day, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Everything that he had created, and Colossians says that Jesus was the creator. He was the one who spoke it into existence. Everything that he created was very good. Genesis 2 verse 9 says, And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's lots of trees. And we can see that even today, can't we? We can see that there are trees that are good and pleasing for the eye, for shade. And they're amazing things. So I get to work with uh, Bart Howard in a Bible study, and he's a tree guy. And so he helps me understand a little bit better. I have much to learn, by the way, uh, about trees. But God says, hey, I've planted all these trees for you, and some of them are good to eat. Okay. And he says there's two specific trees, though. In the middle of the garden, there's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If we look at verses 16 and 17 of chapter two, we read, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So let's remember that when he plants that tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does he say about it in verse 31? It's very good. Okay. The knowledge that that tree, the knowledge of good and evil tree, it's very good. He doesn't say, now I've created everything, but there's one tree that I created that isn't so good. In fact, he doesn't say to Adam and Eve, he doesn't say you can't look at it. He doesn't say you can't observe it. He doesn't say you can't enjoy its shade. He just gives one instruction. You can eat from anything that you want, but you can't eat from that tree. Well, that's the first tree that I want to I, I talk about. 
And we know the story, okay? It's part of the sad part of the story. Well, they were deceived by Satan and they ate and sin and disobedience to God entered the world. So if God knew that they were going to disobey and eat from it, why did he plan it? So far, more questions than answers, right? Uh, by the way, this isn't even the beginning of the story. It is the beginning from a human perspective, but the story actually started much earlier. How do we know? Finally, we find an answer. Turn to 1 Peter 1.20. We'll put it up on the screen for you. 1 Peter 1.20, all the way back in the New Testament from where we were in Genesis. And it gives us a little perspective. He was chosen, it's referring to Jesus here. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. You see, he was chosen, he chose before anything was created for a specific purpose, a specific plan. I'm the youngest of, of four children. I have a sister 10 years older, a sister eight years older, and a brother who's five years older. And I didn't think very much uh, growing up about, you know, whether I was planned or not. Uh, but as I became an, an adult and uh, had it started to have a family of my own, I'm kind of like, wow, I, I'm kind of surprised that they, they had four kids, all right? And so my dad passed away in 2012. And after that, I uh, had uh, some time to spend with my mom and uh, all of us siblings did. And so I was taking her on a drive one day and I got up the courage to say, so mom, it's, it's okay. Uh, if I wasn't exactly planned, uh, it's not gonna bother me, but um, I, I'm curious, uh, was I planned? And she said, uh, yes, you were. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, you had three kids. You didn't have a lot of money. Um, you know, you were both working. I mean, uh, she said, yeah, you, you were planned. But she said it was because of some, some unusual circumstances. And I said, well, can you tell me more? And so she did. My cousin Leonard, who uh, was 16 years old, uh, drowned in the Mississippi, swimming. A tragic accident. But his parents, my aunt and uncle, had three other sons, younger than, than Leonard, and it was their sons who helped them get through the grieving process. Well, my brother was not especially healthy as a child, um, and he also was a bit accident prone. And so she said, Watching them grieve and knowing that your brother, I said, may, may not make it? And she goes, well, I didn't want to go that far, but yes. Um, she said, well, you were, I said, I was a backup plan. <laughs> I was plan B, <laughs> you know, I was on the bench waiting. And, uh, and she started to, and I said, a spare? <laughs> I was a spare before Harry was a spare. Um, and she said, well, well, yes. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, was a little bit, and then I thought, okay, I'm a spare. It's all right. Jesus wasn't a spare. He wasn't a reaction to what happened in the garden. 
He wasn't plan B, but rather he was always, even before the creation of the world, he was the plan. He chose to be born as a human. He chose to took on flesh to become the God man for one specific purpose for the day where he would say, it is finished. So this story starts before creation. Why would Jesus plant a tree in the garden knowing what he knew? If you can put the slides of the trees up, that'd be great. He wanted relationship with his creation. Let me say that again. Why would he plant the tree in the garden? He wanted relationship with his creation, not born just out of his will, but also born out of our will. It was a high price, an extreme thing to do. And so the story begins for us humans with an opportunity to choose, to obey or to disobey, and we chose poorly. This tree that Adam and Eve thought would benefit them, even though God had instructed to them that it would not benefit them and that they would surely die, this tree that they thought, as they looked at it, surely this won't be what God says. Satan deceives them. And this tree that they thought would bring, in, bring betterment to their life and enhance their life actually wasn't the tree of life. It was the tree of death. Because they were banished from the garden. They were banished from the tree of life. And death and sin would be handed down from generation to generation to generation. And we are sitting here today in the same condition as every other generation, a result of that decision and a result of our own decisions. Because we chase trees that we think will bring us life and we are deceived. And those trees actually bring us death. For thousands of years, God required man to sacrifice animals, to shed their blood, to show that death was a part and blood was a part of what it would take to approach him. But these sacrifices were inadequate for man's salvation. Hebrews 10, four, if you'll put that up, says that it was impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to be sufficient. There is only one sacrifice that would be sufficient. So we're going to skip ahead to the second tree, the cross. So you can put the trees back up if you would. So to the Romans, to the Jews, and even the disciples, this tree appeared to be a tree of death. It was considered a curse. It was considered for the worst of criminals, not all criminals. You had to be really bad to get yourself up on, an, on the tree. This tree that was the tree of death is actually the tree of life. It's not the tree of death. So this tree that looks to all mankind like the tree of death is actually the tree of life. And the tree that they thought was the tree of life was actually the tree of death. The question was, who was going to provide that ultimate sacrifice? Verse nine of, of Hebrews 10, turn there if you would. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. Jesus says to the Father, even before the creation of the world, here I am, the great I am, 
and I am here to do your will. 1 John 2, uh, 2 verse 2 says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Two trees, one at the beginning and one at the end when it was finished. An atoning sacrifice that would mean that there was a way for us. So what was finished? I believe those two thieves on the cross illustrate it for us. Luke, turn to Luke 23, 39 through 43. I realize I'm giving you a lot of verses here this morning. But it's a description like in John, but it gives us more interaction of what those thieves were, were doing when they were hanging on the cross next to Jesus. See both of them in the same proximity of Jesus, one right here and the other one right here and Jesus in the middle. And here's the interaction. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. So he's saying, if you're the Christ, you'll be able to save yourself. Why would you, would you be up here? And by the way, save us too. Jesus doesn't respond to him. Never responds at all to that thief. But the other criminal rebuked him, meaning rebuking the other thief. So he can hear, they're close enough, he can hear what's going on. And he says, don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He says, he's God. Don't you fear God? He's God. He's done nothing wrong. We're deserving, we're sinners. We're deserving what we're getting. And then in faith, he says to him, remember me, Jesus, when you enter your kingdom. All the pieces of the gospel. Fearing God, understanding that you're a sinner, and then asking Jesus to save you. That's it. It is not complicated. And here's his response to that sinner, that thief. Jesus answered him, yeah, I'll think about it. Is that what he says? No, he doesn't say, I'll think about it. What's he say? says, today you will be with me where? Paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now I would have thought the other thief would have gone, paradise? I mean, hey, can you explain this a little more? I'd like to get on this too. But there's no record of any other interaction. In the midst of death, Jesus promises the thief life. In the midst of death, he promises him life. Hebrews 10.10 says that by his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You see, when God looks at us, he doesn't look at us as thieves. We are all thieves, by the way. And he doesn't look at us as thieves because the sacrifice that was paid, we have been made holy. I don't understand all that. But I'm glad the payment has been made. The way has been created. You see, Jesus had a choice. Sometimes we think that he didn't have a choice. Oh, he had a choice. He had a choice to go to the cross or not. He didn't have to. But on that cross, the sacrificial payment was made so that we could have an internal relationship with our creator. Why don't you guys come up? The uh, 
readers this morning were two of our grandchildren, Max and, and Camille. And so we have seven grandchildren, and these are just two of them. And you keep standing, Max, even though you're taller than me. Um, and so Max loves sports and he loves golf, which uh, doesn't disappoint me. We played 18 holes together yesterday. And Camille loves tumbling and gymnastics. They're both in the second grade and they did a great job reading this morning. Thank you. And... Um, you know, Diane and I would do anything to maintain relationship, to have relationship with our grandchildren, with our children. Why? Because we love them, okay? We love them. And we do even more if we could, you know, to secure that they had an eternal relationship with their father. Max asked me this morning, he said on the, on the way to church, we we're driving together. They stayed overnight last night at our house. He's from West Des Moines and Camille's from Coralville. And he said, hey, when you were growing up, did you ride horses or did you drive in cars? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I drove in cars. He said, well, how about your dad? And uh, I said, at, his, at the beginning of his life, he did, he did ride some horses and wagons, but mainly cars. You see, the relationship that, uh, that God has and wants to have with us is like this. He wants us to come to him and bring any question we want. He wants to be our father, our grandfather, so to speak. He wants just to love on us. And he only went to the cross for one reason, you. Mankind, humans. That's it. What was started before the creation of the world, what was planted in the garden, thousands of years in between, was then finished on the cross. Why? So that we could have an invitation from him I invited them a few weeks ago to join me, to work with me by reading the scripture. And they both said yes. And I was glad to hear that both of them would say yes. But I didn't want them to come and read without being willing. That's how God is. He invites us into relationship with him. He knows it's good for us. He knows it'll be great. He wants to work with us. He wants us to give an have an opportunity to participate with him, to enjoy life, not just here, but for eternity. And so the gospel is just that. We are thieves. He is God. We need saving. And if we accept his invitation, we get to spend eternity in paradise. And so that invitation is out to all of us this morning. Some of you I know are walking closely with the Lord and you've accepted that invitation and you're enjoying the relationship. Praise the Lord. Some of you have accepted the invitation, but you've been wandering off the path. You know what? He loves you. He just wants you back in fellowship with him. And for some of you, you haven't ever accepted that invitation for whatever reason. But this morning, there's an opportunity to do just that. But ultimately, it is your choice.
justifiably convicted. The size of a single sin may seem like a grain of sand, but its effect infects the whole of a man. The evidence of my personal rebellion was clear to the jury. As I sat grieved to be condemned, my ear was easily bent to the father of lies as he held my failures in front of my face, watching and laughing at my desperate disposition. His demons smiled while tears streamed down the judge's face. For there was no question that my lying, cheating, stealing, and lusting was enough for this sentence, for my last breath, for the wages of sin is certainly death. There I stood, guilty of countless charges. who knew no sin, walked into the room. I hadn't seen him or rather known him, yet he proceeded to take every record under my name and write his own, piling each one of my sins on top of him. He then died a death meant for me, my penalty. And when the judge looked at me, all he could see was him. He said to me, story. With the tree and the garden as a catalyst for God's ultimate glory, within each page of his word weaves a scarlet cord, the promise of salvation, the old made new, my debt erased. How can this really be true? I may not walk straight, or elegantly at all, but now I stand in awe. And I will continue to speak of the three nails on the rugged tree that sealed my hope for eternity. For my life is a witness to your cry on the cross. It is.